Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Insights, Newcastle University's Public Lectures Programme. I'm Martin Farr, co-chair of the Public Lectures Committee. It gives me an enormous pleasure to welcome you to this week's event. Uh, a few items of housekeeping. Please could you ensure your phones are in a silent mode. Um, not expecting a fire drill, so if you hear the alarm, please follow the instructions of our event stewards. Uh, if you wish to tweet, or X, I should say, uh, we're on hashtag InsightsNCL, uh, where debate can continue. Um, and after the lecture, there'll be a Q&A. And after that, there'll be a book signing where you can meet the author with a stand outside in the hall. Also, there's a table with the program and a nice yellow leaflet uh, for the rest of uh, the semester. Uh, our chair this evening, to whom I'll be handing over now, is Dr. Philippa Page, who is a senior lecturer in Spanish here at Newcastle University and is co-director of the Humanities Research Institute. Philippa. Thank you very much, Martin. So, it's my absolute pleasure, um, on behalf of Newcastle University, the wonderful Insights team, um, which I would like to thank very much, and colleagues in modern languages, to welcome Dr. Andrea Heftanovic to the Insights Public Lecture Series this evening. Um, Andrea is a Chilean writer and scholar of Jewish Serb Serbian ancestry. She's the author of several novels, including Escenario de Guerra, Theatre of War, Geografía de la Lengua, Love in a Foreign Language, of two volumes of short stories, No aceptes caramelos de extraños, Don't take candy from strangers, and Destinos errantes, Roving destinations, the English translation of which <coughs> will be published imminently by Lexington Books in the United States. In addition, she has published the essay collections Right from the Trapeze, Children Speak, and Dialogues with Isadora Aguirre. Her work has received several prizes, including the Chilean Art Critics Circle Award, the Chilean National Book and Reading Council Awards, and the English language publication of Theatre of War, translated by Francis Riddle, and published in the UK by Chargo Press, won the Pen Translates Award as well. Her visit to Newcastle is in part to celebrate and promote the publication of Theatre of War in translation. It is a powerful exploration of the deeply conflicted internal and external landscapes that contour the childhood memory of state violence growing up under dictatorship. More broadly, Andrea is not afraid of controversy, seeing art as a space for moral and ethical experimentation, the inheritance of loss, the violence of desire, and the inner urge to find a sense of self count among her many and varied subjects. So Andrea joins us today from the University of Santiago de Chile, where she combines academic scholarship with her literary work as part of a group of feminist writers rewriting the democracy of post-dictatorship Chile with their feet on and in their own terms. And she's also a theatre critic. And that was your first question when you arrived for the first time in Newcastle yesterday was, where can I find the theatres? I'm not sure this is quite the one you had in mind, but I hand over to Andrea. Thank you very much. This is the microphone. Yes. Good evening. I'm so happy to be here. And oh, wow, what an honor to have uh, this audience. Uh, thank you so much. And of course, I would like to thank to the Insights Public Lectures team uh, for all uh, their work for this uh, beautiful uh, program. Uh, I saw the, the talks planned this year, especially to Amber and then to Martin and Stephanie. And of course, a special thanks to my dear colleague and friend, uh, Philippa Page. And of course, to the all, all the modern language uh, department. I do not have the, the opportunity to present in English very often. So I thank you in advance for your understanding and patience. <laughs> well, and you see the title, Writing with your feet, women who walk 
as an exercise of memory and writing. So I will start. First, walking as a cultural act. What has the act of walking meant in the history of humanity? How has it changed over time? How does the, the act of walking change according to variables such as gender, social class, ethnic origin, physical condition, condition or age? What does it mean to walk in more recent times when collective walking and demonstrations have taken over the streets, the cities, and the world. What does it mean to walk with others? How has the, has the act of walking been redef redefined since the pandemic lockdowns, during which we were required to stay at home and limit our movements? Why and under what circumstances do women walk? What obstacles do they face when they do it? Why would an author talk about the act of walking rather than the craft of writing? We might think that walking and writing are exclusive activities, but in this talk, I would like to explore how closely linked they are. A desire to make sense of the experience of walking has motivated my most recent readings and reflections. What I would like to, to share and explore with you today is how these fascinating texts have encountered my understanding of walking as an artistic scholar and activist, and how I relate, relate them to my own walking writing. Walking is a cultural exercise, has been reflected upon in several books, and I will show you some books. Uh, for example, Of Walking in Eyes by Bernard Herzog, Wanderlust, uh, here, uh, two books of uh, Rebecca Solnit, A Philosophy of Walking by Frederick Gross, and Travel Theory of Michael Onfray, Present, The politi Politics of Presence, by Diana Taylor, Walkers by Edgardo Scott, Feminist City by Le Leslie Kern, Flanez by Lauren Elkin, The Revolution of the Flanez, oh, here I am, <coughs> um, by the Spanish journalist Ana Maria Iglesias, and of course others. You can see the covers that are in Spanish, but I, I told you that the the titles in English, this among others. What I learned from these readings is that, the, is that walking is an activity in which many fields intersect, landscape, anatomy, philosophy, gender, anthropology, culture, religion, and geography. Walking has created paths, roads, commercial routes, and religions pilgrimages. So why are we not more attentive to the information that accumulates on the soles of our feet, to the knowledge that gets inscribed on the prints of our toes? In some way, the street of the road we take, the meaning of the day is thrown out by and on our feet. We forget that a good part of history has been written with the feet of citizens walking through their cities, through natural landscapes, and over unknown sites. That image summoned me, summoned me, the idea of the stuttering in, a, in new spaces generates new languages, new textualities. What I mean by this is a space never for described in my narration when I'm able to name it. Walking is also a visual activity. We see from another perspective, landscapes succeed in continuity. In continuity. We see lines of trees, facades of buildings. We experiment other notions of time and we follow other references. 
We are so used to fragmentation, to cutting from an, one thing to another, that walking places us, at times, on a moemius strip. Feet, trees, waters, change together in a loop of infinity. The outside stretches on our mind like the ancestral drawings on the walls of a cave. Walking is a means and an end, journey and destiny. Perhaps walking should be conceived as movement rather than always as a journey because one, one can walk in circles or indeed travel around the world immobilized in a seat. In, a seat. in addition, we know that walking is not always a thoughtless, thoughtless activity or an adventure. Sometimes the displacements are forced, mainly due to war, political crisis, poverty, natural disasters, and religions persecu persecutions. Walking exercises a type of associative thinking, one that is minimally structured and always improved. Rebecca Solnit offers this suggestive idea. I'm reading uh, her quotation. The rhythm of walking generates a type of rhythm of thinking about the step by means of a landscape that resounds or stimulates the step through a series of thoughts. That creates a curious consonance between the interior and exterior landscapes, suggesting that mind is also a sort of landscape and that walking is a means of exploring it. French philosopher and historian Michel de Sorteau presents a similar idea in the invention of every day. When he states that workers are practitioners of the city, because a city is made to be walked. A city is a language, a repository of possibilities, and walking is the act of an enunciation in that language of choosing between those possibilities. Just as language limits what we can set, architecture limits where one can walk, but the walker invents other ways of walking. However, in the face of individualism, profitability, and revenueness, walking in a city becomes, becomes a subversive activity. We are used to the figure of a white middle class walking man, the flaner, followed by this counterpart, the flanes, the women. I would like to expand the term flaner as an inflection to span the meaning of this can canonical literary figure beyond its elit elitist and androcentric perspective. Because walking has always been done in all social classes, by all genders, by all racial or ethnic groups, varying abilities and ages. However, is it has not been the same experience for everyone. The freedom to walk in freely and evidently is a right not held by everyone, making it a privilege. I return to these questions. Why and under what circumstances do women walk? What obstacles do they face? How does the worker record the experience of displacement? Whilst I speak today from my own personal experience and subject position as a woman who writes and walks and evoke the category of women more collectively and in all its splendid openness and diversity. So number two, I guess, or three. <laughs> Marches and demonstrations as collective walks. Not all walks are lonely. There are walks with others, and especially with other women. 
because women working are usually understood as a performance rather than in terms of circulation. That is, that is women work not to, not to see, but to be seen. Precis precisely in the demonstration, the body is exhibited, but with the intention of inscribing its own civic demands, whether against violence, harassment, in favor of equal pay, the politicals of care, the preservation of the environment. In recent years, something of the Sovivians and civil resistance. In that sense, Diana Taylor's notion is revealing in her essay, Pres Present or Present, where she states, being present is a commitment to be witness, a joyful accompaniment with walking and talking with others, an ontological and epistemic reflection as presence and subjectivity as relational, relational participation. Walking is also a tool for strengthening society, civil society that can stand up to violence, fear, and repression. Over the years, I have witnessed numerous marches in my country and, in, and also in my continent. Yes. From the 80s. The Thursday public walks of the mothers and grandmothers of the Plaza de Mayo in Argentina. A human rights organization with the goal of finding their disappeared children and stolen and appropriated grandchildren during the, the years 1976 and 1983 during the Argentina military dictatorship. The organization was founded to loca locate children kidnap kidnapped during that repression. Some of them born to mothers in prison who never later disappear and to return these children to their surviving bio biological families. To this moment, to this year, I would say they, they have found 130 um, lost uh, grandchildren. Then, in 2011, I was also with a witness of the National Student Movement fighting for the right to public education, whose former leaders are the current government in Chile. Nowadays, our president and all the ministers. ministers. Then, in 2018, the feminist movement demanding the end of patriarchal violence and harassment, also demanding reprodu uh, reproductive rights and the abol abol abolition of abortion penalties. In the works by the feminist movement, we observe how the woman's body is redefined. Energetic women are seen advancing, dancing, where the painted bodies marking their step with choreographies and creative slogans. They mock the taboo of repression and put in another way the women bodies with a festive and insolent spirit. Moreover, most importantly, they mark out the, trans the transition from obj object to subject. Let me show you some of these images. You know, this is... Uh, Madres y abuelas de la Plaza de Mayo, they go every Thursday in um, a square. In the beginning, they were called Las Locas, the crazy ones. Mm -hmm. Then you see, uh, these are old photos because that, that's why they are in white and, and black. This is the, the square you see, and also with uh, these slogans. Then this is the last feminist movement in Chile. Um, the universities were closed for uh, almost three months and they were demanding <laughs> equal um, teams, equal uh, I mean, uh, women and men and minorities as uh, professors, also in the, uh, the readings. 
So you can say, it's my right to walk without fear. And you see all, all their, the way they are painted. Then um, if I, uh, to go home, I want to be free, not brave. Uh, what the state, um, I don't know, punish or treat in a bad way, women the same, uh, defend themselves. Um, well, uh, to be macho is hard to, to translate, like to be like a violent or patriarchal person, not all men, of course. Uh, then uh, it is because the education is re responsible of that. And while well, we are the grand uh, daughters of those brujas, <laughs> uh, you, you couldn't able to, to burn witches. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, then, uh, the, so beautiful about this uh, uh, feminist march, all the generations together. So this, like grandmother is saying, what I didn't have to, for me, I would like it for, for them, for the youngest. Um, we are more, I mean, we are stronger than fear. Uh, to be, uh, please, just to be a woman, a woman is not synonymous to be a risky uh, factor. Uh, you see all these choreographies and masks and, I don't know, dancing. Uh, this one, I took this photo from the last uh, March 8th in Barcelona. So it's in Catalan. I don't know if somebody here. So it's like, please go out from the cave. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, so the next one. Let me focus on the last feminist demonstration camp vigil I partic participate in. It took, it took place on September 10th at the commemoration of the 50 years since the, since the 1973 military coup d'etat, uh, military coup. It was organized by several feminist and human rights collectives who create the action, Mujeres por Nunca Más, Women for Never Again, Democracy Under Siege at 50. Remembering what happened when the military forces interrupt Salvador Allende's democratic government. Installing, installing yes, a cruel dictatorship under Augusto Pinochet's control from 19. 1973 to 1988. The instructions for this march were simple. Wear black cloth, carry a candle, use comfortable shoes, keep silent, and be present at 6 p.m. close to the presidential Moneda Palace. Why only, only women, you may ask? And the collective answered this way. It is an event, event, sorry, an event organized by women and for women to recognize that they were, they also, they also suffer and they also were in resistant actions. Let's remember that at least 3,000 of women were victims of sexual violence, torture, and disappears, disappearance. They said, during the event, we will not make loud statements or shout. We will be maintaining only the necessary silence to open ourselves to a reflection that arises from the fact that 50 years ago, our daily lives, as, some, as, as so many other people, were also destroyed. We learned to work together and reach agreements. The new generations that fight for a more just, diverse, and inclusive democracy also have this learning. So from this learning, we say, women for never more again. That day, thousands of women of different generations appear wearing black along the sidewalks of La Alameda Avenue on the east side, 
was the node from which the rows started filling from one side to another and then converged into a single row that will later embrace the palace among darkness, walking silently around the Moneda building while drums marking the passage. I will show you some images. You see, it was like um, night, all wearing blacks. Some of them were with the drums. Ah, I have a, an, a video. Organizado por el colectivo Mujeres por el Nunca Más, unas 1.500 mujeres vestidas de negro y con velas en la mano se concentraron frente al Palacio Presidencial de Chile para rendir homenaje a las víctimas del dictador Augusto Pinochet. Nosotros estamos por el Nunca Más, que nunca más en Chile haya un golpe de Estado, que nunca más se persiga a la gente, que nunca más se torture, que nunca más se mate a los inocentes en Chile. Gaby Rivera, presidenta de la Agrupación de Familiares de Detenidos Desaparecidos, destacó la profunda significación de la vigilia a la que participaron solo mujeres. Debemos de recordar que cada uno de los familiares detenidos desaparecidos fueron hombres los que se llevaron, por lo tanto quedaron las mujeres solas. Y eso también representa hoy día que, no sé, que a pesar de estar sola estamos todas juntas. El acto fue pacífico y un conmovedor recordatorio del dolor y la pérdida sufridos durante la dictadura. Muchas de las mujeres son familiares de desaparecidos forzosos, algunos de los cuales perdieron la vida en la incesante búsqueda de sus seres queridos. Anne-Marie García, Associated Press. There you have other, for me, powerful uh, image. It was like a three hours act. Uh, in, in this moment, it was a, like, very silent. And uh, you see different, I mean, women for different um, generations. And sorry, the video was in Spanish, not able to find the translation. But you, I think you got the idea, more or less. Some of them, uh, they were widows or uh, women that had to, I mean, to, to have the, their lives alone because they lost uh, their partners and uh, those who suffer a lot. Then you see in a different uh, area of the uh, uh, La Moneda, the, the government, That's, this was like the, the last uh, stage of this walking. And at the end, this manifesto was uh, uh, read in a, in, a, uh, in a loud way. You, you need never more dictatorship, never more censor, uh, censor idea, uh, ideas, never more stolen kids, um, uh, never more um, tortured bodies, never more, never more, sorry, sexual violence, political uh, sexual violence. No, never more hate uh, between uh, siblings, uh, never more um, people in jail, and a lot mm, of different ideas. So I like the lot. This one is, I will try to translate. If not, you, you help me, uh, Philippa. Do um, you remember uh, La Odisea? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, I mean, like uh, Penelope, go out of Itaca, <laughs> uh, the ocean or the, the sea is also yours. So the idea that not always women has to stay at home, also they can travel and they can go to the public sphere. Yes, and then the other, uh, ah, just to, to finish, that day of the women demonstration that day I felt, if we walk together, we make history. Yes, the following. 
my walking, writing, or writing, walking. There is a tendency to associate literature produced by women with enclosed and domestic spaces. I, myself, have written about intimacy. For women authors to walk and write about this exercise or about the practice of traveling, in a way, is to go against the idea of the one's own room or to think about an extraterritorial, extra even in Spanish difficult, <laughs> room for one's, of one's own. However, let's remember that Virginia Woolf herself defend street hunting, like the desire to walk in anonymity, anonymity as an experience of otherness and as an act that awakens a fervent desire for a pencil, walking for transformation. There have always been women who have written about the walking experience, authors who have exercised displacement as literary hermeneutics. For some, the fears of walking through the city resonates in their text. The subtle violence, daily harassment, segregation, what is forbidden and what is permitted. In my works as an author, I would like to say that traveling has to do with thinking and walking. On journeys, time and space are measured differently. Stories of travel are vector, vector narrations. We follow an arrow. Sometimes we walk to reconstruct the origin of our ancestors and their forced um, trips in times of crisis, revolutions, wars, persecutions. Or maybe we walk in a place of memory so as not to forget and to know these ruins, to be there and to imagine the past from a certain scenario. Writing is also a physical exercise, among other things. It implies to move out, to sit and stand up, to fly, to navigate. It implies coming to terms with the spectral presence of the past and the future. On each journey, I have tried to plot my own cartographic narrative because history goes back both in time and space. Each era has its own image of a, what a map is. A book by Karl Schlochel, a very excellent um, German geographer, called In Space We Read Time, accompany me on these itineraries that have, that have been open since then. There I read, I would like to share with you this quotation. Cultural landscapes are like immense texts. In a way to explore any city is to read its fossils records backwards. Some of them are easily read, others require specialists. One knows that authors in some of them, but the majority are anonymous. They are written in many languages that we understand well or not in other cases. Among many texts, there are correspondences, others lack mutual reference. I like the idea of turning walking into a methodology of meditation and writing. One walks to return to one's origins, to the tour along the road and reformulate the destination. The same magma of thoughts and remembers unfolds best during strolls. I have attempted to develop, develop a literary her hermeneutics from my gaze as a Chilean daughter of European migrant refugees who escaped to Latin America during World War II. In my case, somehow, I was trying to make a translation of that gen genealogy as a space of mediation between an identity stressed by the foreign past in the Balkans and the Latin American of the present or vice versa. 
My writings correspond to slow journeys, extensive walks, visits to places, and conversations with local people, like anthropological, anthropological <laughs> explorations seeking sediments of unburied ancestors. Many times I felt that those journeys were an internal process of recognizing family and literary heritage. To free myself in part from my origins, even if it seems paradoxical. To find alignment and reach my own synthesis. A way to find anchors, places, dates, memorials, a soundtrack. Something to animate messages from family memory. It, it is not only about ethnic origins, but also about authors who marked me or are imaginary or unconsciousness references. Something like going to the source and then it be, be possible to interpret it. Every heritage has its features. It is a mobile legacy that is updated you can impose another direction on the text. As Foucault said, we must laugh at the solemnity of origins. Write with some degree of infidelity from a certain betrayal. We are all part of foreigners and orphans. Then the traumatic memories of my predecessors intersect with experience of living under the military dictatorship in Chile. I was a person who lived as a child and teenager under Pinochet, Pinochet regime, where the war memories of my parents were superimposed onto fresh images of weapons, shelling, torture, detention centers, soldiers in the streets, intimidation, and the he helicopters flying over the city. Perhaps I think I have said that I'm writing to say everything that was silenced during those years. Thus, my cultural identity was signed onto a damaged genealogy. There was something else. There was a damaged language. The difficult stories of both of my parents and grandparents circulate in another language. Every time they talk about their past, with other relatives, adult relatives, they use the Serbo-Croatian and the Sephardic Ladino. When those foreign sounds were part of the soundtrack at home, I knew they were talking about something children should not hear. Maybe my walking writing <coughs> is a response to cat catastrophic loss, about the need to start a second life, the response to this catastrophic loss was we mentioned. These stories are a combination of what I have lived, imagined, read, and feared. In each one, I walked several miles through many, from, through main avenues, secret passage. In writing, writing texts for my book, I felt that I was walking across boundaries that were not only ge geographical, that were also physical, cultural, and personal. Literature itself is always a dialogue on the border. Writing, writing is to propose a barrier and extend an invitation to cross it. So this, has, this is the book um, the, uh, with all this, uh, a collection of these short stories, also travel chronics. This is the Spain uh, edition, the Chilean edition, and now the new one, Urban Destinations, that is uh, coming out very soon in the United States by Lexicon Books. I have made journeys in which I walk by day, by night, following maps, absolutely lost and random or racing to a point. I like to walk as a means to meditate and write. I would like to share some of these personal walks that took form around the experience of walking and crossing borders. There are eight in total in the books, but I will 
I will briefly focus on four of them. When I was finally able to travel to Yugoslavia in 1997, Yugoslavia no longer existed. I arrived in Sarajevo looking for familiar addresses, but the city was razed to the ground after the Balkan War. I rented a room where I had to walk through the ruins of the post-Civil War and, and in some way after in reconstruction. As soon as I arrived, I, will, I was received by the phrase, welcome to hell, written in red letters on a wall. From that moment, I felt myself descending into the circles of the Divine Comedy by Dante Alighieri, you know the, the book. I would like to add that this text is always in motion. It changes every time I return to Sarajevo and I have done it several times and I'm planning to go always. It has, it has until now been a walk of infinity with new writings, new projects, new conversations and new files. Then you can have a, this is a image from the Miliaska River, uh, like a more nice uh, photo. Then you have, this is my first photos from the first trip in 1997, all destroyed. This was a la the daily newspaper um, tower. Then a lot of places that in the past were parks to have a good time. They became, became cemeteries and this is the, the corner where the attentado attent uh, for the First World War was committed, uh, Francisco Jose, the empire. Then you see um, places that were my, my family houses were all bombed and all, I mean, open and all destroyed. This is uh, in the, without, uh, before the Google Maps. <laughs> I like to, to keep these maps with all my signs and I don't know, uh, bills and all, everything. And I visit also, you can see it as a long story. I went to a tunnel that connects a neighborhood to the airport. And through the, this tunnel, they could save lives and had, I don't know, food, and of course also arms. Uh, this is some photos of this secret tunnel during the war, the, during the siege. Other. I made a second journey to Rio, Rio de Janeiro, following the itinerary of the characters of the short stories by Brazilian writer Clarice Lispector, the Ukrainian-born Brazilian novelist and short story writer, whose innovative and metaphysical works have been a source of inspiration for me. I created a route, road, following the movement of the fictional characters from her short stories and the author's daily walks. I went to the botanical garden, to the zoo, to the seaside, to, the ar to her archive, and read the secret files as her, for example, as her Russia test report. Curious, I don't know why I found that. Uh, you know, it's a psychological test. It was following their paths, their destinies. I, I even slept in the same hotel where the specter used to avoid family duties to be able to write alone. I also walk, ah, I can see, this is some places of the, where the, the stories uh, take place, the botanical garden, and a, and a short story, story called Amor, Love, uh, where the main character sits and thinks a lot of things, many things. Uh, these are my no notes during the visit to the archive. The next one. I also walk and write locally in my own neighborhood between Salvador Allende's house bombed at 6 a.m. that day, 11, September 11, and the bicycle workshop ran by a cycl cyclist detained during the, the Chilean dictatorship, the cyclist Peter Tormen, whose brother is a, still now a disappeared victim. 
I tried to trace the memories of that September 11th when Hawker Hunter warplanes over, overflew my house. This is an image, I was three years old, that I identify as my first memory. On that I have called Steel Birds, I wrote this piece. Then my walks between my home and the bike workshop by where Peter, national champion cyclist, repaired our bikes. We became friends. Among tires, wheels, and long conversations where I tried to understand how this man experienced detention and torture with only 14 years old. Then how he has fought ever since to recognize the memory of his disappeared brother, also a very known cyclist, dedicating, for example, his sports victory to his family's struggle. Then I can show you, uh, this is a, was a, a great scandal. He was on TV, 1987, almost the end of the dictatorship. Uh, he won the contest and the TV uh, asked him, to whom you dedicate this picture, like a silly question. And he, I mean, we were in the dictatorship, to my disappeared brother. And uh, TV went into black, you say, when, yeah? And they stopped the transmission and he lost all the support and his uh, sport career stopped forever. Yes, horrible. He was a great, and he's a great man. Ah, this is other, I will not have time. This is with a Japanese uh, um, poet. I did some uh, project together with Chile and, and Peru. And I will, the last one. Also, I traveled to be in the bedroom of Noam, a child victim of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, whose father is part of, a, of an organization that brings together the relatives of victims from both peoples and fight to find ways to be, to coexist, to live together. The name of this organization still exists and please follow them, it is Parent Circle Family Forum. And also I would um, like to make a, like a special homage or uh, homage to these uh, women, they walk together. There are Palestinian and Israeli women that they work together. Women of Sun is the Palestinian uh, group and um, women wait for peace are the Israeli uh, members. They work together in education, educational uh, programs and before this horrible Saturday, they had a wonderful meeting on October 4th. There were thousands of women working, working and walking together. They had once a year an annual uh, march, feminist solidarity march, and they're always demanding to the politicians, please find a solution. We don't want to send our kids again to the war. And I thought, I was like um, in doubt to show this or not because of you know, the current events but I think we must know about these people because it's the only way to have hope and follow them. They use all media. Nashim um, Osolot Shalom is also in English, uh, women uh, wait for peace. This is a group, uh, they do academic, I, I follow them. They have like uh, cooking classes, they went to schools. I went to the schools together. They have doing some bombs and shellings and worse times. They take the square also as the Madres de la Plaza de Mayo and they discuss all together. And they do couples. For example, he's Palestine and she's um, Israeli. They both lost their kids in the conflict. And they work together and they go to political meetings, to the NATO, to uh, meet with presidents. What is useful? I don't know. I don't have no the answer. Sorry. Yeah, I, w I, went, I did a lot of activities with, with them going to schools and other organizations. Uh, this, uh, the last one with, uh, in Cuba. 
So wait. <laughs> Before that, just to, to close, uh, to write about travels and walks is to leave blank spaces, to speak about what which, which we do, you did not succeed in seeing. I have traveled far to resolve the most intimate matters in foreign rooms. At those times, a verse by the Argentina poly, poet Alicia Genovese came to my mind. To go far away, to choose what is your own. Or Maria, Sol, Maria Jose Solano, traveling is the closest thing to reading on to move. So when one travels, one is aware that, that one's existence, among many others, has been chosen. Then comes that vertigo and the fundament, fundamental question, how many lives can one have? Thank you very much.